technology wasn't as good. You didn't have the monocrystalline panels, the microinverters, the low profile look great on your roof. It used to be a bit of an ISO. Now these panels are gorgeous. They look amazing. They last forever. They're so efficient. So it's like, you know, the power companies, the reason they're assholes is because they could be. They were the only game in town. And when someone has a monopoly like that, and they're the only game in town, what do they do? Well, they do whatever they want, right? Now they can't do whatever they want. You have the ability to take power back, because here's the deal. They gotta go get the oil or the coal or whatever they're getting from somewhere God knows where. Hopefully it's domestic. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it is, right? They gotta ship it here, they gotta burn it, they gotta pollute the atmosphere to spin some turbine that makes steam, that spins a magnet inside a thing that creates electricity, they gotta then ship that electricity all through the grid and all this massive infrastructure, bring it into your house, step down the voltage, don't kill everybody, or blow up your house the second it enters your house. They step down that voltage, right? You start using it, they're charging you, whether they break it down in your bill or not, you, don't might, you might not see a distribution charge in Texas. Most states you do, I don't think you do here, right? They don't break out, do they break out distribution? Delivery charge. Do they? Delivery charge. Yeah. Delivery charge. Delivery charge, right? So depending on the state, it's different. Sometimes they'll break out each individual charge. But at the end of the day, what you're paying for, you're not just paying for generating electricity. Generating electricity is what? That's buying the oil, the coal, and burning it, the actual cost to spin the generators, right? That's part of what you're paying for. The second thing you're paying for is what? They gotta then take that and safely deliver that across a distance to you, right? Which costs a lot of money. All those wires and infrastructure that keeps going down in storms and whatnot. Just to maintain that safety is a huge expense. They gotta bring it into your house, step down the voltage. They got that meter spinning only in one direction in the olden days. And every time you do anything in your house that requires power, you turn on your lights, your vacuum cleaner, your dishwasher, whatever it might be, that meter is spinning, spinning, spinning. And it especially spins fast when? In the summertime, when you gotta run your damn AC, right? Well, the true beauty of solar is in the summertime, when you're blasting your AC and you're trying to keep cool, well, guess what? That sun's blasting on your roof. And you're generating so much electricity, you can actually have a surplus and be selling power back to the grid. What could be better than that? What I'm doing right now, so I'm just starting to, all I'm doing is I'm just giving you some random lines here to start. So I want you to understand, so much of solar, of selling this stuff, once you make the value proposition, which is so easy, and we'll go through that after, okay, how, you know, I think is the clearest way to just say, hey, it's really this simple. It's to take this, yes, we do, boom, 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 it just adds up to less, right? Then, when you get someone close, it's all about these little things that you say as you keep looping. How many of you guys know the straight lines this little? Some of you do good. I'll go back and do a refresher on the whole straight line. I want you to understand that what I'm doing right now is just giving you sort of these language patterns here that you, that you say to people like as you're moving them down the straight line, meaning from the open to the close, right? So let me just to close this loop here, and then we'll go back to the beginning of the straight line to how I created it, why it works so well, and how exactly you apply it in solar. And, and I know that I've never had someone go through training with this and not dramatically increase their closing rate. It just works. It really does, guys. It works in every industry, and it works especially well in solar because solar has got a really strong logical value proposition. The straight line is based on creating these airtight logical cases. So you get someone to the point where they're like, damn, that makes sense. Wow, that's a good idea. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do it, but boy, that's a good idea. Hey, yeah, I'm not doing it these days. I'm not stupid. I'm not, I just met the guy, but I mean, I'm, but like, damn, that's fucking good, you know? <laughs> right? That's step one. Once I got someone there, I'm done. 95% of that person is going to get closed because then I'll go about creating the airtight emotional case. People don't buy on logic. They buy on emotion and justify the decisions with logic. But if you don't have the logical case in place, the mind, the brain serves as a human bullshit detector. So you can't just try to go and just impulse on, so it's great, oh my God, it's great, you'll take the money, you'll do this, you'll have the power back in the power company, you control your own destiny, no more price increases, and the certainty of having the same payment, blah, 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 right? That's all, but if you haven't actually connected the dots first, 
of why it's a better value. Then their brain saying, yeah, yeah, bullshit, bullshit, I get it, but they haven't really explained it yet to me why it makes so much sense. So if you try to just tell someone, imagine how great it will be in five years from now, you'll have your system partially paid off, you're saving money every month, you have your power, you'll control back your electricity, you're paying out all these great things, and you're saving the planet, and you got your tax credit, what can you do? But you didn't actually go through the equation that just shows them that there's no way, no matter how you look at it, soberly, slowly, very slowly, I, I, like there's nothing, that's, I'm wondering, my job here is to show you that this is just a better value. The decision to buy or not, that's up to you. I'm just here to show you the better value. Once you got them saying, I see what they see, wow, I get it now. I never, no one really took the time to explain to me why it makes so much sense. It's the mistake that most solar people make. And, and sometimes, it's, it's, I know you guys don't, and when I, we met at dinner last night, I was like, thank God this company's not doing that. You guys are taking the more of a value-based approach to it. There's two, there's two ways to sell solar, and I work with companies all over the country. One way is more like, hey, let me show you the math. It's really simple, and those are the companies that always make much more money. They make a lot more money, they get a lot less cancellations, then there's those who are just throwing shit against the wall, and they have untrained salesmen going out, making crazy promises, all right? And they get a lot of cancellations, and the salesmen are turning over constantly. Maybe they make 100 grand a year, 80 grand a year, but they're not making the big money, and they're not building a business that one day could be worth a billion dollars or more because this is a great business. It really is a great business, and it has longevity if you do it right. So when I talk about the straight line system, what I'm really saying is that when we look at sales, I think the biggest mistake that some people make, especially new, new salespeople, is that they don't really understand what they're doing when they sell. Like, what are you actually doing as a salesperson? What does that mean? I'm saying, oh, you know, I get people to say, yeah, but what's really happening? So I had a broker, you've all seen the movie, I'm sure, right? I not many of you read the book because you're freaking lazy, okay? But everybody has seen the movie. I admit, I don't read that much either, so I don't fault you guys, okay? But the book is really good, by the way. I think the movie's crazy. The book is 10 times crazy, okay? The shit in the book, I'll tell you one story about the books. I'm writing this book. I'll digress the videos. I'm writing this book. It's 2006, and I start writing this crazy stuff. And I have a female editor at Random House, you know? And I write this first scene about I'm doing one with a hooker and I'm doing this and this is happening. It's all this crazy stuff. I'm not like that anymore. I'm, I'm fully normal now, sort of, okay? <laughs> this is the most part, all right? But I'm writing this stuff, which is like terrible. I'm doing all this awful, like great stuff, you know? And, and I'm like, I wonder what the editor's going to think at Random House. It's like I'm saying stuff like people don't normally say when they write books about this and this happening to me and that happening to me, all these compromising positions, right? I'm really compromising, all right? And I send it, it's like the first chapter with this prostitute and this with a candle and all this sort of stuff, right? <laughs> and she writes me back this, so, oh my God, you're such a bad boy, exclamation people, they're like, wow, I'm like, this is really good. So I go to the next chapter and I go even more, and she's like, oh, double exclamation, you're the best, you're you know, such a bad boy, people, right? And I'm like, this is such, so every chapter is like crazier and crazier, right? And then and she's like, oh my God, this is wonderful, laugh out loud, funny, oh, terrible, oh my God. I'm like, this is unbelievable. Finally, we get to the part of my bachelor party. All right? And I'm like, in Vegas now, and I start writing this like disgusting, depraved, Sodom and Gomorrah-like scene about what's happening at my bachelor party in Las Vegas. And like, there's people still missing to this day. They never stayed for a server. don't know what happened to them. We lost like two brokers, okay? But it was like this completely insane scene of like acts of depravity like you've never even heard of, thought of before. Well, some of you probably played off. Some of you maybe thought of. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, they're terrible. Anyway, <laughs> and I write this out in, in like in like in like just the most intimate detail of every vile, disgusting act and things that happened at this bachelor party, right? And it was like 120 hookers and 150 strat nights and just animals and drugs and everything else you could think of, right? Oh, yeah. And I send out the pages to the editor. I'm like, I wonder what she's gonna say this one, you know? And about two days later, I get back email. I just don't think other humans will understand. <laughs> anyway, 
anyway, so she made me edit that part out. But other than that, the book is really crazy. You know, so I have a, like, in the book, there's one little part that's like a disconnect. It says, like, and I, I'm playing blackjack downstairs with my friend, and I'm like, I'm back then I was, was, I wasn't sober yet, so I'm like on a massive amount of coke, and, and I'm up like a million dollars, he's up two million dollars, the bachelor party's upstairs raging away. We go upstairs in the elevator, right? I open the doors, I'm like, and there it is, the bachelor party. And then I wrote seven of the most disgusting pages you've ever seen ever. But in the book it says, and I was so disgusted, I turned around and walked out. <laughs> Doesn't say what I saw, like, what did he see? Oh, right? Those pages do exist, by the way, they're, they're in the vault, all right? Anyway, um, getting back to business, the point I was making is that in um, the, the book I wrote, Way of the Wolf, which is not, which is a business book, right? And it covers the straight line, right? I tell a story about how I started this brokerage firm and I was about 24 years old at the time and I had a system that I was teaching that was really, really good. Didn't have a name, but I had been training salesmen since I was 21. I used to go, to, I started door-to-door -door sales, it was my first job, so I, I go door-to-door -door really well. That's where I was cutting my teeth in door-to-door. -door. I had the worst door-to-door -door job ever, it was selling meat and seafood, the guys in the pickup trucks. You know those guys, right? It's the stupidest job you've ever seen. But I was the number one salesman in the country. I broke the records the first week. My first day on the truck, job, I sold my entire truck, 35 boxes of meat. I almost sold one lady the truck itself, okay? And the first week I sold 250 boxes, like the company average is 40. You get, I, was like, I was like, just like blew away the records. So three weeks later, I said, oh my God. And they were the most disorganized company. It wasn't like this real company. This was like really ridiculous. So I started my own company, built up to 26 trucks, trained tons of salesmen. I made every mistake a young entrepreneur can make. I was overspending. I was undercapitalized. I was growing on credit. I was screening out my employees. I was, I, I'd buy all the trucks. I mean, like I give a guy a truck, and it's, he's smoking crack under a bridge. Where's my meat? He's scoring. I was like, the worst business you've ever seen in your life, right? And I went bankrupt and I lost everything when I was 24, all right? I heard a rumor about a friend of mine. He was not a sharp kid growing up. He was like I'm kind of a weird kid. You know like the kid that no one wanted to play with when you were growing up? Like he was that kid with the house that smelled funny. No one wanted to go in the kid's house. He had a grandma that used to beat us up with an umbrella, right? So no one liked the kid. I hear this rumor, this kid thinks Michael Falk, true story. He's making a million dollars a year on Wall Street as a stockbroker. It's 1986, like, what, a million dollars? It's $20,000, it seemed like an impossibly large amount, right? You think about that, this is the, it's like three million a year now. It's like, it's, you know, it was a long time ago, right? And, and I didn't think it was possible that a week later, now I'm broke, I'm out of work, right? I'm trying, you know, don't know what to do, right? And he pulls up to the neighborhood, goes from the city back into the base like Queens where I grew up, he's driving a red Ferrari, he's got a gorgeous model next to him, I'm like, he gets out, I want the car, I want the model, I want the suit. I'm like, Michael, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm a stockbroker. I made a million two last year. Stockbrokers, the first to tell you is what they made last year. It's like, well, yeah, I made a million dollars. How are you doing? You know, ask the doctor, hey, what'd you make? What? What do you mean what did I make last year? What you broke? I made a million two. How about you? <laughs> Wall Street, right? And he goes, next year I'll make two million. And I said to myself, what many of you guys, because you all close this, which is why you're in this room, and you probably said to yourself, if that idiot can make a million, I can make 10. That's what I said to myself that day. And I went down to Wall Street, and I literally had to sell myself a job. Because I just declared bankruptcy. I had spent, I told them the story last night, one day I had spent in dental school, believe it or not, because my mom had brainwashed me. And one of the things I want to talk about today is belief systems and the beliefs we have about ourselves and making money and success. My mom had told me since I was in the high chair, she was spoon feeding me applesauce, that the only noble way to get wealthy is to be a doctor or a dentist. Like, as the applesauce is a fucking hypnosis. The applesauce goes in, doctor, dentist, right? So when I was 20 years old, graduating out of college, and if you were to ask me, hey, what do you want to do for a living? I'd say, I want to be rich for a living. I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I'd think, well, my mother had said doctors, dentists, and doctor, eight years, dentistry, four, I'll be a dentist, because dentists get rich to us. They'll be doctor, number four, the world will be perfect. I go to dental school, I get a brilliant student, I do well in school, I apply, I get in. My first day, the dean of the school gets up on the stage, he goes, welcome to the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery, you should be proud to be here, dentistry's a wonderful profession, blah, blah, fucking blah, right? I'm like, all right, well, so far, so good. And then we around, the 100 kids, they're all like bright eyed and bushy tail, right? Then the guy says, but let me say this, the golden age of dentistry is over. If you're here to make a lot of money, you're probably in the wrong place. I'm like, what the fuck? And I got up and I left and I dropped out the first day. 
And I answered this, and that's why I answered a blind man in the paper and started something meeting secret door to door, broke the record, started my own company, trained tons of salespeople, went back, went down to Wall Street. All right, my first day, and just like the movie, my first day as a broker, the market crashed and went down 508 points. And just like that, the firm I was with, LF Rothschild, which had been in business for 112 years, shut its doors. I thought at that day, like I just had to play bankruptcy and now the firm shut down. I had the Midas touch in reverse. Everything I touched turned to shit basically, right? And I went back home and my wife and I, like, I was devastated. Just, you know, I was like wife number one. It was like four wives ago. I have not done very well in the wife department. So like I teach sales mastery, not, not relationship mastery, right? So, trust me. And on that day, everyone in the free world knew the market had crashed. It was going to be the beginning of the next great depression. Everyone was panicking. Except for her. She wasn't much of a news bug, right? She was not the sharpest tool in the shed. So she had a bottle of Dom Perignon. She'd taken our last dollars and she cooked because she just assumed my first day's book and I break the record. So she'd taken our last dollars and bought champagne. And when I walked in the door, like everybody in the world knew the market had crashed my heart. She's like, How'd you do? Did you break the record? I'm like, Oh my God. And I collapsed in her arms. And I started to cry, and that was like probably the worst thing, that gut punch we all take at times as entrepreneurs and salespeople. And by the way, as salespeople selling solely, you are entrepreneurs. You understand that? You own your own businesses within this business. You need to think this way. You'll make a lot more money by thinking as a business owner of things and investing in your own business. We'll get into some of the things you can do to really expand your own businesses within Zenith. Because this is the type of company, one thing I found out last night, which is that you, know, you have ownership that promotes you guys, that wants you guys to make tons of money. That's rare in this world. Most companies want to hold down the sales force. You have a company here, a guy, he gets it. He's trying to, he's lifting people up and letting the sales people make tons of money. It's a rare thing, the great commodity, right? So you're gonna think like entrepreneurs, and I'll discuss that later. Anyway, long story short, she finally, we're looking to help want this entry, she finds an ad in the newspaper, part-time, full-time, like part-time stockbrokers. Like, I was like, wow, I went to this small firm in Long Island, just like the movie, and it was like, I was like, I, think, I couldn't even know what to think, it was like, it was selling penny stocks. I had been trained to sell New York Stock Exchange, big stocks like IBM and Kodak and, you know, big companies, Xerox back then, US Steel, like these companies are not, not even big companies, Intel maybe one you know, right? Anyway, and just like the movie, I made that first pitch and when I was done, I sounded so good on the phone that when I was done, they all gathered around me. They're like, how'd you do that, right? It was just like the movie. Now, one thing that's important for you guys to understand here is that I had not invented the straight line yet. This is before I invented the straight line. But I was still using the straight line system. And you are too, whether you know it or not. Anyone that's closing at a high level is using the system, just using it by accident and not that well. And the sense is, on the days that you're not doing that good, you're probably missing a lot of the points because you're doing it accidentally right now. You're taking some of the element, and you'll see when I explain it why it's just so obvious. When you start using it the right way at the highest level, what happens is every day becomes your best day, and when you're really on, you're just like on the stock, what are you getting massive referrals? And there's no reason you can't double or triple your closing rate in this industry when you're using the straight line at the highest level. I wasn't thinking in terms of that because it was natural. I was a natural born closer at the highest level. And I'm sure in this room there are some of you guys who are like natural born closers. You've always been great at closing, right? And there's natural born closers and there's natural born closers. I had a real gift, I did. I had a natural gift at a very high level, at an extreme level. And that first month I made 50 or 60 grand, which is probably about 150 grand now. And within three or four months, I was making over 100,000 a month selling penny stocks. And these kids had gathered around me every day and I'd give them little meetings. I was just trying to help them out. I wasn't, I didn't own the brands or anything, but I had a little following of people. About four months passed and obviously now all my money problems had fit up. I'm swimming in dough and the opportunity comes up to start my own brokerage firm. Long story short, at first I didn't take it because I had that one failure, but I broke through that limiting belief of maybe I'm not meant to be in business for myself. I started my company and I started off doing what these kids had been doing in the firm I was with. We were selling petty stocks to average moms and pops. And this is very important now. Let's really start to get into the training aspect. That was just a story to give you context. 
So we were selling penny stocks to average moms and dads. That means you had someone that had little or no net worth, someone that was not financially sophisticated, that was financially disempowered for the most part, and you called them up with an idea that was a flyer, like a one in a million shot, almost like buying a lotto ticket, dollar in a dream. And if you did a big trade, they said they'd $500 or $700. A small trade was $200. And it was a relatively easy sale, considering. Because you're not dealing with a traditional Wall Street, where I had come from, where you called a rich man or woman, okay, back in the 80s or 90s. They liked the idea that you presented them a stock. They invest $500,000 in the idea, or a million. So I watched on Wall Street, I worked there for six months as a cold caller, right? I wasn't licensed yet. When I passed my test, the market crashed. So I never got to do that, because the firm closed. Everyone get that? So I watched something happening. They're selling these 30 and 40 and $50 stocks to the richest 1%. And when the richest 1% buy, they're putting in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Then I go to this other world of penny stocks, and I watch how they're calling average moms and dads and selling them a few hundred dollars of a stock, but the commission was very large. So if someone sold $500 of stock, the commission would be $250. On Wall Street, if you sold someone $100,000 of stock, the commission would be $250. You follow me? Very different. Another important difference was on Wall Street, you had to have been a college graduate at a very good school and get very good grades along the way because the belief was, the collective wisdom at the time, is you can't train morons to call rich people. You can't take a 21-year-old kid who barely clawed their way out of high school how is that guy going to get on the phone with the CEO of a hundred million dollar company and convince this person to send him a million dollars and manage his money? Everyone get that? He's not going to sound sophisticated enough. How is that guy going to talk to an empowered man or woman financially when this person's a young kid who's never had any success or track record? Yet, in truth, what I saw when I was on Wall Street was these kids weren't 21 or 22 like Stratton, I said, they were 26 to 30. And while they'd gone to good schools, they didn't have any success under their belt. They were full of shit. They were talking the talk, but they hadn't really walked the walk. But they were taking advantage of a few things. And I'll explain what those things are in a minute when I get further along on the server. They were able to, a guy who was 29 or 30 years old, like a Mark Hanna, that trained me, he was not an analyst or an investment, but he'd get on the phone, call a CEO like a Dr. Pepper, back then, like then Roger, John Albers, back then, Mark Klein, right? And, and he, I'm from LF Rothschild, he's for the call today, blah, 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 and talk all confident, name of the company's Microsoft, and boom, you get a rich person to buy. And believe it or not, Shocked me because I came from door to door sales that people were sending in millions of dollars on phone calls. Not even face to face, just phone calls, right? So you have this dichotomy of worlds. You have traditional Wall Street with well educated, mostly men, some women too, working at these big established firms on Wall Street calling up wealthy investors, very wealthy investors, and asking for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in investments and succeeding wildly, making half a million to $2 million a year as an average broker back then, right? Then you had the petty stock world, where all these little firms were dotted around the countryside of uneducated kids who didn't do that well in school, who badly clawed their way out of high school, right? Didn't go to college calling average moms and pops, getting these tiny trades, and making maybe eighty to $130,000 a year, which was a lot more than they ever thought they'd make, because most of them would have ended up working in 7-Elevens if it wasn't for that, right? They were not kids that had high aspirations. These were not kids that had been told by their parents they were capable of greatness or worthy of greatness. And any greatness they naturally had in them had been literally conditioned out of them since the day they were born. First by their parents, 
then by their own school teachers, by their friends, the media. By the time they walk into my border at the age of 20, they've been conditioned to survive, not to thrive. None of them had grown up as members of the Lucky Sperm Club, so to speak. There wasn't an Ivy League diploma among them. My kids were the young, the downtrodden, the forgotten sons and daughters of middle class and lower middle class families on Long Island and New York City. And they came and the, the collective wisdom was as those the people that sell penny stocks. And it all worked and that was the world as it was before Stratton. I broke all these records and I started my own company, Stratton, in 1988. So uh, fall of 88. And we were selling penny stocks to average moms and pops. That was my business for about the first three months. And we were doing really, really well. And I was teaching a system of selling. And it was working phenomenally well. Didn't have a name, but it was about tonality, sounding good. You know, I had some scripts I'd written, and these guys every day I'd give these great meetings, and it worked, right? Then one day I'm lying in bed, I wake up, and poof, the light bulb comes on. I'm like, wait a second. Why are we calling poor people? We should be calling rich people. This is insane. Like, you know, this old adage, if you want to rob a bank, why do they rob banks? That's where the money is, right? Or why, yeah, it's not, it doesn't help you, but kind of in a way, right? You know, but why are we calling people with little or no net worth? It doesn't make sense. So I said, okay, I learned my lesson about like, you know, about how to run businesses that you have to test the ideas. So the idea was I was gonna take these 12 brokers that worked for me and let them continue to call people they were calling, and I would test the idea myself of calling the richest 1% and selling them penny stocks. Myself and my junior partner, Danny, the Jonah Hill character, who was an absolute madman, by the way, all right? And I had trained Danny, he was a natural born closer like me, and he required a little bit of training, but once he was trained, he did great. So together we tried to sell pennies. We bought a list of the richest 1%. It was called the Dun & Bradstreet list, we started calling these people up, and to my shock, no one would buy penny stocks. We couldn't sell them penny stocks. And that was what the manager had said to me the first day. I said, why are you calling poor people? He said, rich people don't buy penny stocks. I said, why? Because they just don't, whatever. And I think, oh, maybe they just think they're pieces of shit. And I guess because the stock is trading at 20 cents, it must be a piece of shit, right? It sounds like I guess it is, right? It looks like it smells like it. it must be it, right? So I said, I know what to do. Since the stock is 20 cents, maybe I can do what's called the reverse split. Now, it doesn't matter. What this really means is that you take a company and say, take a stock that's 10 cents. You can make that stock $5 if you want. And you just take the number of shares and you make, let's, let's, you can take a 10 cent stock and make it a dollar. I'll write this out to you on the board, right? You see understand what's going on here? It's very simple. So let's say you have a, a stock that has one million shares. The total number of shares outstanding is one million, right? And the stock is priced at one dollar. What's the value of that company? One million dollars. There's one million different individual chunks or shares, so to speak, of the company. It's priced at a buck. So the total value, if you want to buy the whole company, is what? Right. Well. You could just as easily say, let's have 10 million shares and price it at 10 cents a share. What's the value of the company? A million dollars. Same shit. So when you talk about what's the price of a stock, if I want, I can make Facebook into a penny stock by increasing the number of shares by a thousand. You can take any stock and make it a penny stock by multiplying, in the States, the number of outstanding shares times the price. I can take a 10 cent stock and make it, so watch, I can take this stock and make it $5 by what? Divide this by 50. Same company, same value. So I said, let me, and that's done all the time on Wall Street. It's legal, it's accepted. Companies that get, the price goes too high, they say, hmm, the stock's $150, people are not gonna wanna buy that, let's do a split. They'll do a two for one split, bring the stock down to 75, and now you have twice as many shares, same company. Everyone get this? So I said, maybe people are not buying stocks at 10 cents, because at 10 cents it seems like a piece of shit. Maybe they'll think it's less of a piece of shit at five dollars, right? So I did that, and I reversed with the stock, and I made the stock five dollars a share. Company's name was Ventura Entertainment. 
And I went out and I wrote this great pitch for Ventura. And it's you know, owned by the Osmond Studio in Orem, Utah, and blah, 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 blah. And the pitch was great. To my shock, though, when I tried to sell that to rich people, they bought a little bit, but no more than they were buying at the penny stocks. There was no difference. And that surprised me, right? I was like, wow, that's really weird. So I'm lying in bed now, I'm saying, how come this is not working? It's really disturbed me. And then I get this, oh, inspiration. I know what's going on. I said, when I was calling from LF Rothschild, well, the Rothschild banking name is one of the most prestigious banking names in the world. And I was selling typically a stock like back then of like IBM or the Facebook of that day, a, a company they had heard of. So watch what was happening. So the dynamics, imagine there's, there's three things going on. There's three sets here. Number one, um, my name is Jordan Belfort. They don't know me, but I'm calling from LF Rothschild, check, they know the company, and I'm selling IBM, check, they know the stock. They're familiar with the company that I work for. They're familiar with the product I'm trying to sell them. They just don't know me. Two things in my favor, one against. I got a good fighting chance. Now, what I'm trying to do is it's Jordan Belfort calling from Stratton Oakmont. They never heard of Stratton. Selling Ventura Entertainment, never heard of that. Strike, strike, strike. What happens if you have three strikes? You're out. And that was a breakthrough for me. I'm like, ah, I get it. That now it, I said, now I take this. As good as I was, and I was as good as you could possibly be on a telephone. You took me on the phone, guys, I sound as good as anyone on the planet, right? But even I couldn't convince people to send me a quarter million dollars for a company they never heard of, working for a privilege they never heard of, and they never heard of me either. It's three strikes and you're out. I said, I need to tip the odds in my favor. So let me start off, and rather than recommending Ventura Entertainment, let me start off by recommending a company they had actually heard of and were familiar with, like a blue chip consumer products company. And back then it was Eastman Kodak. Any of you guys know Kodak now? Used to be the big, one of the biggest companies in the world. It was a camera company, famous you know, consumer products company. Everyone had used the cameras, right? So that was a well-respected called a blue chip company. So I wrote this amazing script for Kodak. It's really, really powerful skip for Eastman doesn't work for Eastman Kodak, right? And I said, okay, the second thing is I have to somehow tip the odds in my favor for Stratton. I never heard of Stratton. So what I did is I came up, I wrote a script, this great idea. I said, we call people up and I said, hey, Jordan Belfort calling from Stratton, Oakland in, uh, in uh, Lake Success Long. How you doing today? They created, you might not have heard of my company, Stratton, because for the last 10 years, we were strictly an institutional block trading firm, doing a select for banks, insurance companies, and pension funds. However, we recently opened up our doors to the more substantial private investor like yourself, and all I want to do right now, with your permission, of course, is send you out some information on my company, Stratton Oakmont, and then get back to you down the road and make a recognition to our institutional clients. Does that sound fair enough? That was true, by the way. That was not a lie. Stratton had been in business for 10 years. They were a trading firm, okay? So I, I didn't start Stratton. I bought Stratton. I was, a, I was an office, what's called a branch office in the beginning. I ultimately bought it, right? I was a branch office of a company that had been in business for 10 years. They were a trading firm dealing with bank to bank institutions. The biggest piece of shit trading firm you ever seen in your life. Terrible company, no money, never had any, but what I came up with was the truth well told. I didn't say, oh, you never heard of Stratton's with the worst firm on Wall Street. I said, you might not have heard us because for the last 10 years, we were strictly an institutional trading firm dealing with banks, insurance companies, and pension funds. That's what they did. I had low months, however, recently opened up our doors, and that was true. We've recently opened up our doors to the more substantial private investor like yourself, 
And all I want to do today is serve with your permission, send you out a bit of information on the company, Stratton, and get back to you down the road. Next time we're making a recommendation to our core client base. Does that sound fair enough? And they say, yeah, sure, send me the information. So what I did there, that's called reframing. Coming up with a better way of explaining something. One of the big mistakes I see in solar, I just did a trade for another solar company on the East Coast, is that they would say something to a client that just sounded like shit. It's like, that's the best you can explain your company? Oh, let me tell you about my company. We've just been in business for six months now. We've done four inflation. That's smart. Like, the question really is, let me tell you a little bit about Zenith and exactly what we do. We are what? Well, no reason to tell me the second, but I can assure you this. There's a hundred ways to talk about Zenith. There's a hundred different ways to explain Zenith. But there's only one way that's the absolute best. That's the truth that doesn't lie, that sounds great, that makes logical sense, emotional sense, that highlights all its strengths. So you don't have to lie. I'm not saying that by any stretch. But what you need to do is have the best version of the truth. There's lots of ways to explain Zenith. One of them sounds awesome. Far more awesome than all the others. There's many ways to explain solar. One of them is far better than the others. As a salesperson, your job, if you want to close at the highest level, is to learn how to come up with the best version of saying things in a way that connects with customers, empowers them, it gives them the information they need to make an informed, intelligent decision, but also moves them emotionally too. Sounds good. And there are some overarching rules that, like, as you say that, you can't break rapport, piss them off, bore them to death, make them not trust you. So there's other rules as well, but the point is, is that in this case, I realized, okay, well, there's many ways to talk about Stratton. And so you might not have heard of Stratton before because they lost all their money when the market crashed. They're hanging on by a thread right now. And I want to send you some information, so maybe if you do say stop the company from going out of business, you could have said that too. But the absolute best possible version of what you could say was, for the last 10 years, it was strictly an institutional trading firm dealing with a select group of banks, insurance companies. You get it? Truth well told. So what that did is it reframed. It's called a reframer. And it was a reason why, a justification of why they never heard of Stratton before, right? Now, are they going to buy just because of that? No. But at least it opens the possibility up to listen. There's a reason why you probably haven't heard of us, Jim, because for the last 10 years, we're strictly doing that. We've recently opened up our doors. Everyone get this, right? So again, I tip this in my favor by coming up with a reason why, turned a negative into a positive. I say, I'm not gonna sell Ventura. I'm gonna sell a company like Eastman Kodak first. I tip that to a positive. And now all there is is that one same negative, and guess what happened when we tried again? Boom! Danny and I started opening up accounts like water. Like water. Every day, two accounts, three accounts. There's a lot of accounts on Wall Street, right? Within a week, we had about 30 or 40 accounts each that we opened. Hadn't made any money yet. So now I called Danny back. He said, all right, Danny, here's what we're going to do now. Second trade. Call the guy back and say, hey, two reasons for the call. Number one, I want to update you on your position in Kodak. Now, where is Kodak? Guys, where is it? Before I made 40, so where is it? Who knows? I'll tell you what. It's in one of three places, up, down, or even. If the stock was up, you'd say, listen, the stock's up a touch. Things look great. The long-term thesis remains intact. The thesis was that they were in a lawsuit, and when the lawsuit center, the stock would shoot up higher. So like a three-month play. So far, things look great, but the long-term thesis looks amazing, blah, 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 blah. If the stock was even, you'd say, 
to them, listen, the stock is right when we bought it, things look great though, long term, you get it? The stock was down, I was like, hey, the stock is all for touch, it's fine though, the long term thesis remains intact, right? But it didn't matter. Now, just to, to get technical, we made another call before that, just to schmooze, how you doing? Update before that call, right? But on the seventh day, you called them back with this formal call and say, hey, you know, two reasons for the call. Number one was to update you on Eastman Kodak. And number two, something else just came across my desk. It's a bit different, one of our own investment banking clients. Perhaps the best thing I've seen in the last six months. If you have 60 seconds, I want to share the idea with you. You got a minute? They're like, yeah, shoot, now you're their stockbroker. That was my idea. So we started calling these people back with now this six, it was a six, we first put it to six bucks, same stock, then direct entertainment, right? We reverse put it. And Danny's got his stack of leads, I got mine. Now remember, the average trade for a penny stock was how big? $500 and you make about $250 in commission. So we start dialing through our stacks of leads. Danny gets the first connect. Like the second, he just won't pick up, right? So I put my phone down, I'm in my office, Danny's out in the boardroom, all right? The other 12 guys, the other 12 guys are still pitching the old penny stocks to moms and pops. So I'm watching Danny talk for a minute or two, and he hangs up the phone, and he comes back in holding like a buy. He has a weird look on his face. He's holding a buy ticket. I'm like, what happened? He goes, the guy bought $120,000 worth and apologized for working so small. On that trade, I made $80,000 in one trade. And my heart literally skipped the beat. And in that moment, I knew. In that moment, I knew. I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, I am gonna be a billionaire. I cracked the code. One trade, $80,000. And I looked out into the boardroom to the 12 young strat knights who had an average IQ of Forrest Gump on three hits of acid, basically, right? And I said to myself, all I gotta do is teach these 12 numbskulls to close rich people and the rest, as they say, will be history. Well, guess what? As they also say, easier said than fucking done. As it turned out, to train a bunch of barely post-adolescent nincompoops, how to close the richest, toughest, most sophisticated investors in the world, wasn't just difficult, it was impossible. It turned out to be impossible. After one month, they had not opened up even a single account. Not even one. Trying to call rich people. Meanwhile, as that's happening, myself and Danny are calling up the same list, the same leads. My closing rate is now 50% or higher. Danny's is in the 30s. Calling the same people, using the same scripts on the same stocks. I'm like, what the hell is going? How is that possible? Just imagine that. Myself, imagine you the owner, and so you guys are closing every single sale, and no one can close, you're like, what is going on here? This can't be that only I can do this and then, and I, and I got into this frenzy, I'm like, this is not possible. So I had this like billion dollar idea, but after one month, they hadn't closed even one sale. And all the guys were kicking and screaming, let's go back to selling pennies, dogs. it's so much better. The rich people are all assholes. They're mean, they hang up on us, it's impossible. So I started now going to a different level of education myself in sales. I started going out there and trying to find courses in sales. I'm like, maybe there's something wrong with my system. I had a system I, I was teaching. So I started looking at all the other sales trends. I read books, there was no internet back then, but I went to the library, I bought books, I went to some seminars, I flew clear across the country to California, I attended a seminar of all the great sales trainers, and I quickly found out that they were completely and utterly full of shit. That my system, which was not working, it worked for penny stocks, but when you ratcheted up the pressure to this ultra tough sale, the system collapsed under the weight of how difficult it was. And my system was 10 times better than all these other things I had seen out there. You get it? It's like engineering. You know, they have something called the catastrophic failure. They do stress tests. When you when they build a bridge down, they do a stress test. Because how, how robust, how powerful is a system? 
Well, you don't really know until you stress it to the point of failure. So I thought my training system was amazing. I thought I was the world's greatest sales trainer when I was teaching these kids my old system until I tried to use that system to close the most difficult people in the world, rich, pain in the ass businessmen, and it just collapsed. And I said to myself, wow, so my system doesn't work. No one's system is even nearly as good as mine. I'm screwed, I, I, I was in a box, right? So I flew back to Stratton, I was in the West, I flew back to the East Coast, and now the guys were like in full revolt, they wanted to quit, you know? They wanted to go back to selling penny stocks. Like, here we go back to selling the moms and pops. The rich people are all ass also. They said, we want you to do one of your marathon nighttime training sessions. I did these marathon sessions like once every two weeks. I do like a block of three or four hours at night. And I said, all right guys, let's come back tonight. We'll do a training session, right? So we all went home, came back at seven o'clock and it was about 12 brokers, 13 brokers in the room. And I remember this day like it was yesterday, it was 7 p.m. on a Tuesday evening. And I looked at these long, sad faces that had not closed the deal in a month. And I'm like, guys, I'm like, I honestly don't get this. You know, I'm doing it, Danny's doing it, we're making a fortune. I know you guys can do it too. What's wrong? Why is this so difficult? And they're like, first there's silence. Like, guys, come on, you know, I'm not leaving until we get this right. What's going on? Following some guy goes, there's too many objections. And then he goes, yeah, there's a thousand objections. And then he goes, yeah, the rich people are ass. They keep cutting us off. We can't even get our pictures off. There's so many objections. But he goes, yeah, there's a thousand objections. I said, really? A thousand? Yeah, there's a thousand. I said, great. Let's write all thousand down. I said, I want to write all thousand objections down on the whiteboard. And the whiteboard was just like this, just the size of a dry erase board. I said, let's go through all the objections one by one. Come on, let's go. Who wants to start? And my goal was I was going to do something called running the wheel. I used to take the objections all in a circle and I go and I'd show them one by one how I overcame them, right? That was my plan for that night, right? So I said, come on guys, let's start. Who's first? So after a couple of seconds of silence, right, some guy says, let me think about it. I want to think about it. I said, great, let me think about it. I wrote think on the, I guess this one. So let me think about it. Where is it? This one, yeah. Let me think about it, right? So I write think about it on the board. Erase this, by the way, is this stuff erased enough? Yeah. Right? Is there an eraser? Where's the eraser? Right, yeah. I got this one. Perfect. So I wrote, think about it on the board, right? I said, guys, what's next? Someone says they want to talk to their wife. So I think about it on the board. What's next? Their wife. Their wife. I said, great. What's next? They want to call back. I said, great. They want to call back. What's next? Bad time here. Great. Bad time here. What's next? I said, guys, that's four. Is 996 to go. Let's keep going. We got a few left, right? And on and on they went, on and on they went. They kept on objection after objection after objection until the entire board was filled with objections, which at the end of the day was not quite 1,000, it was 14 fucking objections. <laughs> that was it. 14. And half of them or repeats of two. It's a bad time of year, as in it's tax time, it's back to school time, it's Groundhog Day, it's freaking leap year, right? Or I need to speak to my wife, my lawyer, my accountant, my, I need to speak to someone else. So about half of them were just like variations of these two. Want to speak to someone else or not the right time. Christmas time, tax time, back to school time, right? And in that moment, I, I looked, I remember looking at these objections, and I just got so angry, I got really angry inside, because not that they lied to me, it was just that I knew in my heart that I had this amazing idea, like it was a breakthrough, right? No one had done this before, and I, and I, just, I was just so angry, and I'm like, you know, you guys are unbelievable. Like, you know, you're whining, you're crying about all these objections, you have a thousand objections, and at the end of the day, there's only 14, half of them are repeats of two. I'm like, but guys, you know, even those don't matter. I mean, don't you guys get it? Every sale is the same. And that thought just popped in my head. Like, guys, every sale is the same. And they're like, what? And they give me these weird looks. They're like, what do you mean every sale is the same? Like, every sale is not the same. Every sale is different. 
People have different needs, different values, different pain points, different experiences, different predispositions that bring it to them. You know, I can see why their faces like me. I said, guys, every sale is the same. And I, I was like, I had this like this thought, and all of a sudden, pop, some idea pops into my head. I'm like, watch, it's a straight line. And for the first time, I drew this long, thin, straight line on the center of the board. I put a big, thick X on either end. I said, guys, this is your open where the sale begins. This is your close where the client says, yeah, let's do it. And back when you were selling petty stuff, every once in a while, you get one of these perfect lay down sales where they seem to be almost pre-sold before you walk in the door. And you guys know what I'm talking about. When you're walking through a house, they're like, oh, I'm so, oh my God, you're the solar guy. I was waiting for someone to knock on my door. You know, so how much is great, I want it. Everything you say, everything you go, like, yes, yes, yes. Oh my God, what a great, oh my God, you're so cute, thank you so much. Oh my God, would you like some tea? Yes, oh, let me make you dinner. Oh my God, Max, come in here too. Oh my God, the solar guy's getting ready. And it's like almost like just waiting. Who's gonna have one of those, come on. You get those. Every once in a while, you get one of those perfect lay down sales where everything you say and everything you do, they're like, yes, oh my God, great, oh wow, wow. oh my God, yes. Greetings, thoughts, here's a crowd. Oh, here's my credit card, and they buy on the spot. That's what I refer to as the perfect straight line sale. It's almost this one-sided conversation where everything you say, the clients are on board with you, they agree with you, they're like, yes, 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 all the way to the point where you ask for the order, they say yes, boom, without a single objection or question, and they buy. That's the perfect straight line sale, and my guys had gotten those when they were trying to sell penny stocks because it was a low-priced impulse sale, and people were like, oh my god, it's a flyer, yeah, sure, why not, right? And it was a numbers game, you catch them a couple of lay down sales. The only problem is, is that those sales are typically few and far between. What typically happens is you want to keep the prospect, your future client, on the straight line, moving towards the close. They try to take you off the straight line. They have questions, they have objections. They have concerns, they interrupt you. So you want to take them towards the close, keep them on the straight line. They try to take you off the straight line. So what you have is these healthy boundaries above and below the line. When you're inside these boundaries, you are in control of the sale. Meaning that you're moving forward towards the close. You're saying things, you're doing things that are germane to the sale. You're making progress. You could be, on, see, on the straight line means that you are doing the talking and the prospect is listening and you say, make sense? They say, yeah, they agree. And you move forward on the straight line. Everything perfect towards the close. What's the shortest distance between any two points? Straight A straight line. It's a perfect instant sale with no deviations. Every once in a long while you get one. What we have here, though, in the real world of selling, you have these healthy boundaries above and below the line, where you might be talking and they agree, then you, say, then you ask them a question, so tell me how long you lived in the house for. And they say, oh, I've lived in the house for seven years. Now they're talking, and now they're doing the talking, you're doing the listening, right? That's, that's good, that's healthy, Inside the boundaries, you are in control. You've asked a question, the client has responded. That's healthy, normal, and you're making progress. You're finding out relevant information you need to know to A, to design a solution for them, for in this case, solar, to see if they qualify, to see if it makes sense, blah, 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 all the things, all healthy conversations. But what happens very often is that you ask someone a question and they start answering. They're like, oh yeah, I lived here for seven years and before I lived over in, down in Kansas and next thing you know, because I lived in Kansas because we listen to bird hunting in Kansas and next thing they start talking about fucking bird hunting. And they spend, and then you're like, oh my God, bird hunting? I love bird hunting. And you spend 20 minutes
minutes talking about freaking bird hunting, and now you're spiraling off to Pluto up here. You Pluto up here, and you're spiraling down here to your anus. Neither of them are good places to be. But what typically happens is you ask someone a question, and they might start off answering it in a way that is empowering to the sale, keeps you moving forward, giving you information, but they start spiraling off to Pluto, and then an untrained salesperson thinks, hmm, if I jump in there because the nightmare and the water's warm and nightmare, and I'll talk about bird hunting too, maybe they'll like me more and they'll buy from me. Meanwhile, the prospect knows one thing. Ah, this is obviously not an expert in their field because an expert would not spend 35 minutes talking about bird hunting because an expert's busy, their time is money, and you reveal yourself as being the novice, the disingenuous person that you are, spending all your time trying to trick them into buying something by talking about something that has nothing to do with solar. Now that's very different than if they happen to mention that you really is in your sweet spot and there's relevant rapport building conversation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the disingenuous bullshit that you see. Oh my God, you like fly fishing? I like fly fishing. And you've never been fly fishing in your life. And you spend 20 minutes talking about fly fishing because you think that's gonna make them like you and trust you and it doesn't work that way. That's not what rapport is about. Rapport is, real rapport in sales is probably the mis most misunderstood word in the English language. Real rapport is based on two things. Number one, that you care. You care. You're not just there to make a sale and make money. You care about helping them solve a problem, getting them what they want, doing their needs. And you're just like them. Not in the sense that you like fly fishing, I like fly fishing, but you're like them in the sense that when they speak, you're like, aha, uh -huh, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's these little grunts and groans, the unconscious communication, the way you look at, uh-huh, mm-hmm, you listen to them, you speak at the same rate of speech they speak at, you don't ignore what they say, that's what real report is about. When you're on the straight line, you are doing the talking and the client's doing the listening. When, and you're directly on this perfectly constructed sales presentation that you've thought out in your own mind beforehand. There's many ways to present solar, many ways. There's probably 10 things that, that you really have to know, like, boy, I'm just making that number up. But there's certain key things that they have to understand, what their old payment is, their new payment, they have some points, right? And there's many ways that you could say that and close a sale. One way is the most logical way. That's your perfect straight line sale. Meaning, when from the moment you open up your mouth, you take immediate control of the sale and you start presenting solar in the way that you had planned out beforehand, it's your best version of the pitch, right? It's like the best way that you play, your own favorite way. That's your perfect straight line sale. In the real world though, what happens, even in very good, strong sales rule, they don't typically follow that always. Sometimes you have to jump from here to here to here to here to here, and you're jumping around based on what's happening in the give and take in a real conversation. But where you never are is up here in Pluto and you're on your apex. You're not there. Okay? You're inside the boundaries. You're moving forward towards the close. And I'll get into that later in my jumping around. The point is, is the perfect straight line sale is your best, most elegant, simplest presentation. When you're speaking, you're directly on the line. That's the phrase we use. You're on the line moving forward towards the close. When the prospect is answering your questions, because remember, what do you do? As sales, you must ask questions to identify their needs, to know about them. How do you design a system? How do you know what to sell someone? What's the best fit? You have to ask questions. You gather intelligence, right? So based on those, when you ask a question, you're on the line. When they answer, you're off the line and you're listening, uh-huh, yup, got it, uh-huh. And we'll get to how you listen in a really powerful way after. And then you might also be forced to jump around a little bit so you're not exactly in the perfect presentation you created, but you always 
end up making it, you miss what you made up, you back up, you loop back, and you end up making this semi-perfect presentation that stays relatively close to your plan. So you hit all your key points, you stay in control, and you move forward towards the close, and they buy. That's what's going on. What was happening at Stratton, and what I realized that night, is that from the first words out of my broker's mouths, they were revealing one thing. They were not experts in their field. They did not sound like me. I had a certain way of talking, a certain way of communicating, that for literally when I opened up my mouth, in three or four seconds, they're like, whoa, this guy is not like the average person I speak to. And I communicated my positioning as an expert, someone that was sharp on the ball. And it was happening right away. And I looked at the strategy and said, guys, when you're speaking to people who are wealthy and smart or simply in power, and by the way, today, everyone's smart. They got smartphones, right? People aren't stupid. You got four seconds. You got four seconds to establish three crucial things. And if you don't establish these three things in those first four seconds, you're done. You can't close anybody. And I'll tell you exactly what they are. In the first four seconds, you must be perceived as being number one, sharp as attack. That you're sharp, you're on the ball. Number two, that you're enthusiastic as hell. Enthusiasm. Now, I'm not talking about that bullshit like, oh my God, my practice is so great. No, that's over, I don't mean over the top enthusiasm. You run, oh my God, my life is That's not what I mean. I'm talking about bottled enthusiasm, which is different. It sits below the surface, a certain way of talking. You could be whispering, and there's a power in your voice that just says, damn, this person, they really believe in what they're doing. They're certain, it's, like, it's like an enthusiasm, and that sort of enthusiasm is palpable. And when people hear it, they're like, damn, what they, what they have must be good. It's an unconscious reaction. So number one, you must, in those first four seconds, you must be, number one, sharp as attack. Number two, enthusiastic as hell. Number three, an expert in your field. And this is the most important one of all. You must be perceived as being an expert in your field. Because here's what happens. When you're perceived that way, what people say to themselves is, this is a person worth listening to. And even one level up because they can help me achieve my goals. They can help me get what I want. Guys, we have been conditioned since we're yay big to defer to experts. When we're in the presence of an expert, we have been taught and told by our parents and society that we are supposed to defer and allow the expert to control the flow of the conversation. When you were a little boy or girl and you were sick, what happened? Your parents would take you to the doctor and you'd go to a doctor and you'd see the, the stethoscope around his neck, the white jacket, the diplomas, and you notice even your own parents would defer to this doctor. This doctor went through a lot of schooling. He was an expert at making sick people feel better. And it was almost like you felt better just by walking in his office. As soon as he saw you, you'd feel better. And when the doctor finally saw you, and he said to you, so tell me, how long have you been having this problem? What do you say? Huh, how long have you no problem for? You don't answer his question with a question. What do you do? You answer honestly, you answer forthrightly, you allow the doctor to ask you questions and you respond fully. And you allow the doctor to control the flow of the encounter. Why? He's earned the right to. He's an expert in his field. Everyone get this is a crucial point. Because what does the doctor do? You walk into a doctor's office and he says, all right, hey, you know my name? Okay, here's your pills. What does he do? He does an examination. What's the first one? Oral. What does an oral examination consist of? Him asking what? Questions. And what do you do? You answer. 
You don't eat the rotten. You don't cut them off or her off. I'll take it one step further. We've been conditioned so much that even nowadays as adults, the conditioning continues. When we get older, you got in trouble, you would seek out a lawyer. Our parents hired tutors for us, coaches, experts. Get, we wanted to succeed, we sought out an expert who was the best at what they did. And when that expert gave us direction, we listened, we solved problems. We've been conditioned to allow experts to control the encounters. We don't try to take control. A month ago, I had to go to the urologist. You know, not a pleasant experience, right? You guys all know this shit, the older ones. And you get to that point in the examination, and the doctor's like, all right, bend over. I'm like, oh, fuck, no. <laughs> you put the rubber glove on the Vaseline, oh, it's this thing is finger in my butt, right? I'm like, come on, what do I, what do, I do? I bend over, let's I stick a finger in my ass. <laughs> Why? Why? He's a doctor. He's earned the right to stick his finger in my ass. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? What would you do if the doctor, some physician's assistant, will get all the doctors, please, I'm going to stick my finger in your ass. Get the fuck off. That's what it was, really. But the point is, is most of the time, I probably say, you stick your finger in my ass. You haven't been to medical school. You haven't earned the right. <laughs> it's a funny way of doing this. We get it now. You understand what I'm saying? No, this is true. We defer. I can't tell you, if there's one thing you take away from today, is if you can learn to speak and carry yourself like an expert at what you do, your close rate will triple just from that alone. Just from that alone. Especially if you take to heart what I say next. Because here's the deal. Once you have control of the encounter, all these wonderful things happen. The first thing is, is now you can make what? You can make every sale the same. The reason every sale was the same to me is because I had a certain way of sounding. I would instantly take control of the sale, and then I had this certain way, boom, boom, I line up these elements in my mind. This is what natural born closers do automatically. They automatically know that they sound a certain way, they sound great, they're on point, they sound like experts, they take control, and they start unpacking, they ask questions, they identify needs, they solve a problem with a solution, they pitch, and they know how to then loop back and they overcome up to They do it naturally. They could not do that if they were not in control, because then you all like playing reactive ball. And how are you, listen, here's the deal. As it turned out, there are three core elements. This was the next leap of logic that night. This one night all came out of me in 1988. There's three things that must line up in every sale before your prospect says yes. I don't care if you're selling solar, or alarm systems, pest control, or anything else in this world, doesn't matter. There are three things that must line up. In fact, I was training people in pest control yesterday, and the same three things, was, they were all nine, and the same three things must line up in every sale. We call those three elements the three tens. And the context is a state of certainty. So watch, imagine a line here. Can you erase that for a bit? So imagine a line or a continuum of certainty. And on one side of the continuum, you have the number one. Watch, this is your continuum. You really got issues with the markers, guys. Okay? You have any markers that will work? Thanks. Okay? So you have this line or continuum of certainty, right? On one side, you have the number one. And the other side, you have the number 10. A one to 10, where we rate everything in this world, right? One to 10. When something is a 10, it's the what? It is the absolute best thing since sliced bread. It is the world's greatest solar system, the best deal in the world, the ultimate solution. So what does someone sound like? What does a prospect sound like when they're at a 10 on the certainty scale? The solar. If you would say to the problem, hey, what do you think of this solar system? 
They'd be like, oh my God, this is the world's greatest solar system. It is beautiful to look at, it never breaks down, it lowers my bill, it's cost effective, it's amazing, it's clean energy, it helps me. It is the world's greatest. There is no better system than this one. It's the best value for the money, the financing package is amazing. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It's the best. That's a 10. A one would be, hey, what do you think of the solar system? That is the biggest piece of shit solar system in the whole world. The Chip Chinese panels that break all the time. It's ugly to look at. It doesn't make that much power. It's not efficient. It always breaks down. It's overpriced. It smells. It's a piece. I'm embarrassed to even think about this system. That's a one. Question. Where do you want your prospect on that scale? So let me draw it out now, okay? You have to walk you're watching, right? So let me draw it out right now. This is the certainty for you. You have... Ah, there you go. A one and a ten. Where do you want the prosper? You ask them to buy. You ask for the order. Where do you want them? As close to a ten as possible, right? Or at a ten, right? As close as possible, right? Because if they're at a one, then you're going to say, I ain't buying, right? They're at a ten, okay? Things start to get interesting. One, this is your certainty. Continue, right? And just so you understand that what sales really is at the highest level is the transference of emotion. Sales is the transference of emotion. And the primary emotion that you're transferring is certainty. Certainty about your house, or in this case, also certainty about your product, right? That you're, that you're gonna take this solar system and install it, save them money, it's gonna be the best one out there. There's absolute certainty about the product. It's the best thing since sliced bread. That makes sense, yes? When you approach a door, where are they on the certainty scale as it relates to solar? Where are they? Who fucking knows? Are you Kreskin, the mind reader guy? How could you possibly know? Where they are is dependent on everything they've ever seen, heard, read, or thought about souls since the day they were born. And whenever they don't really know about souls, their brain will make shit up based on their own prejudices, what they've heard, seen on TV, drove by, and their brain isn't, oh, you're the soul guy, okay. I'm at a four. Or maybe they said, oh, wow, there's some of my friends got they love it. Maybe they're in a nine. You don't know where they are. You, you don't know. What you go, you go, but what you do know is they're somewhere. Because they're from planet Earth. They're not like from us. Solar, oh, what's solar? What does a solar panel look like? Never heard of that before. Does that ever happen to you? They know what solar is, generally speaking, right? Solar, solar energy, what does that mean? People... No, there's some preconceived notion. The moment that you knock on a door, they open the door, you explain you're the solar guy, they instantly have some level of certainty as it generally relates to solar. Does that make sense? Your job as a salesman is to essentially take them from where they are on that certainty scale so let's say the average person's at a five or six. If you're selling iPhones, you might be at an eight or nine. If you're selling vacation rentals in Mexico, they're probably at a two or one. So every product has like its own average. Solar depends on the area you're in, what other experiences. So in this area, I think it's an early adopter. You probably have a relatively high value. So people probably be at a six plus here. Is there negative predispositions? Mostly or positive here. What is it? Mostly positive, right? So more often that, so you know generally you're probably going to be above a five. But the reason out of a ten is they don't know what you know. They don't know the truth about solar. If they did, if they knew everything you knew about how awesome this product was, how great your service, and the whole nine yards. They'd be at a 10. They think like you would think. 
So your job as a salesman is everything you say, everything you do, everything you show them, everything that comes out of your mouth is designed to what? Increase their level of certainty. So when you're finished and you ask for the order, you've made them certain enough so they want to buy. Does that make sense? So let's say you do that. Let's say you make this presentation and when you're done, you've done a bang up job at explaining why solar energy is this great value. And they're in an absolute 10 on the certainty scale for solar, for the product. Question, will they buy? Yes or no? The answer is maybe. As in maybe they will, and maybe they won't. Why? What if, in the process of doing that, you said something or did something that made them not trust you or like you? Would they buy from you? No way under the sun. We don't buy from people that we don't trust and like, especially on trust. We very seldom buy from those we don't like. So it's not enough that you have them at a 10 for the product. They also must trust and connect with you at a very high level. That's called the second 10. So these are the three 10s. Number one, they must love the product to trust and connect with you. So what does that sound like? Well, if you were to say someone, hey, what do you think of that salesman that sold your solo? Oh my God, the nicest guy, the sweetest girl, the most honest, hardest working, most attentive, wow. They took the time to explain everything to me. I, I, I never felt so empowered. I felt really good about it. They, they took money off. By God, I would just trust them with my family. These people, I would never, ever buy anything in this category without calling them first, because they would be my advisor, my trusted advisor. That's what a 10 sounds like. What does a 1 sound like? That snake in the grass, asshole. He lied to me, he, did it, he deceived me, he, did, he charged me extra afterwards, he left here for, I think he stole 10 bucks out of my wallet. And he's like, that's a 1. Which one closes the deal? 10. Which one gets the referrals? You might be able to close someone in an 8. But do they give you referrals on the spot? Maybe. 10? Oh yeah. They're opening up their phone book and calling Aunt Tilly, Grandma Jones, their next door neighbor Jan and Jill, the states down the road. They are calling everyone and anyone they know when you have them absolutely certain about that first head and second head. True or false? Yes, will they do it? Will they buy? Maybe. What if something you did or maybe something you didn't do, something you didn't say, and they heard negative things about Zenith, the company that stands behind the product. Will they buy? No. Give me an example. There's a time, Toyota, you know guys go to Toyota, right? Toyota's a great company. There's this issue a bunch of years ago with the brakes were like, you know, weren't working. That thing with the brakes, right? <laughs> like the brakes aren't working. Like you're driving your car and all of a sudden it accelerates and there's no brakes, right? And Toyota, in the beginning, was kind of denying the whole thing. They were trying to bury it. And what happened was, is sales plummeted for Toyotas. Plummeted. People still love their Toyota car. People love their local dealer and their salesman. But they did not trust the company that stands behind the product. And when they don't, what do they do? What do they say to you? So watch what happens. You Go to someone's house. You enter the home. They're at a five. Across the board, that's their, that's their number. They, they were in the middle, okay, they're open to it. Oh, yeah, I'm interested in some herds, some good things. You're at a six, right? You spend 35 minutes, you spend an hour there, and when you're done, and you make this beautiful presentation, they're at a seven and a half for the product. They're at a five, a six for you and a six for the company. So what do they say to you? Well, Jordan, thank you for spending your time, but I don't really like your product enough yet. 
I don't trust you as far as I can throw you. And I've heard some things about Zenith that really concern me. Or I just never heard of them before. I don't know if I can trust Zenith. Is that what they say? What do they say? Yeah, let me think about it. Let me call you back. I'm not liquid right now. I gotta speak to my partner, my wife, my aunt, my uncle. They're overpriced. All the common objections that you're getting, guys, are smoke screens for uncertainty. Objections for the money. Now, there's one objection that can be real. I have no money, but here, guess what? Doesn't cost you anything. It's not a real objection. I can't afford it. It's not possible. When they're not buying from you, it's cause one of these three core elements has not gotten a high enough level yet. But we've been taught, like we've been taught, to defer to experts. We have been taught to not tell the truth to pushy salespeople because we don't want to get into a confrontation. So rather than saying to someone, I don't trust you, you're like, well, that's pretty rude. What do I do to you? You can't blame me for all the shifty salespeople you were told about when you were four. Don't trust a salesperson. They only want to make commission. Who was told that by their parents growing up? I was. My parents hated salespeople. Hated them. We've been told not to trust strangers. Don't take candy from them. If it's too good to be true, it must not be true. These were all things that served us when we were five years old. We were told these things so we wouldn't get into cars with strangers. And we wouldn't cross too far the streets away from our house because it's not safe. They served us as children and disempower us as adults. Because here's the truth. As adults, we are able to make informed decisions when the information is in front of us. And the best decisions are typically made when they're fresh in your mind, when you've been explained something both logically and emotionally, and you make your decision. As an adult, as an empowered adult, you should be able to make that decision. Yet there's about half of the population that still have these limiting beliefs about making decisions quickly, about trusting people they don't know personally, and what those people have is called a very high action threshold. And that is now what consists of the fourth element of the straight line. It's called, so watch, you have the five core elements. There's five elements. The first core element, these are five levers, that when you can get all five of these levers lined up, you can close anyone who's closable. And it's really easy to do once you're aware of them. Number one, they must love the product. Number two, they must trust and connect with you. And again, a 10 or one, right? They must trust and connect with the company that stands behind the product. Number four, you must lower their action threshold. Let me tell you what action threshold is. Action threshold represents the collective level of certainty that any particular prospect needs to be at before they feel comfortable enough to say yes. Let me repeat. It's the collective, being all three tens together, it's that collective level, how certain they are, before they feel comfortable enough inside to say, yeah, let's do it. For example, me, I'm a sucker. I am. I am the easiest person to close. I real, I am, I'm, I'm a salesperson's dream. My beliefs are such that I generally trust people, I make my decisions quickly. I think the best ones are made quickly. I have what's called a low action pressure. What that means is you don't have to get me to a 10, 10, 10. I could be 
reasonably certain, and I buy. I'm like, all right, well, what the hell? Sure, why not? No big deal. I'm like, eight, 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 yeah, great. Then you have my father. May he rest in peace. My father had the highest action special. He was the toughest nut to crack for sale. I mean, he hated salespeople. My father had to be at a 10, 10, 10, and damn sure of it. This is a 9.5, 9.9, 10. No fucking, he ain't buying. He had to be at Absolutely certain of all three tens, or well, he's not buying everything. Why? What's really happening? What's really happening is this. When I make a decision, right before I say yes or no, I'm running these two parallel movies. I'm saying to myself, if I say yes, What's my upside? What's my, how good is the upside? And I imagine, I run the movie, say, if I say yes, I see myself in the future having bought this product, feeling good, so on, so forth. And simultaneously, I'm also saying, if I say yes, and the salesman turns out to be a lime gene themed scumbag, what's my downside? And I run that movie too. Human beings are fear-based creatures. It's wired into our reptilian brain. We always consider the downside risk as well. It's not just the upside. Before we make a decision, we run both movies. When I'm faced with a buying decision, I run the positive movie and I run the negative movie. When my father was faced with a buying decision, He'd run the positive movie, and he'd also run the negative movie. The difference was, is that me, with a low action threshold, being this sort of half glass full positive thinker, I run a really long, exaggerated positive movie. I allow myself to say, wow, if this worked out, I'll allow myself to step into the future, experience the product, feeling that I play out the movie. I run a really long, colorful, empowering, positive movie. And when it comes to the downside movie, I run that one through, but I blunt it. I'm like, yeah, maybe it'll fuck that. I stop it. I'll run it there, not that bad. So what happens? I say yes. When my brain, the way my brain weighs decisions, I'm a positive guy. I said, oh, like, give me an example. It's a perfect example. Many years ago, I was walking through an airport in Western Australia, and I heard the sweat, fuck, I'm like, what the fuck is that? It was a guy selling some golf contraption inside an airport. He, had, he was like a, a golf to help fix your swing, right? And I walked over, it was an Asian kid, slender guy, and I said, what's this? He said, oh, it's the best thing in the world, watch. And he shows me, yeah, you got Velcro on the golf head, Velcro on the ball, you take a swing, and it goes, looks like a ball into the window. He goes, no, it looks right into your club. And based on where you make contact, on the heel of the toe, and inside, outside of the ball, you can fix your hooker slice. Who plays golf? It's the fucking hardest game in the world. The chance this thing actually works is like zero, right? So what do I say? Well, how much does it cost? I say, God, it's only $75. So I say to myself, well, what's the worst that could possibly happen? Not that much. Like, ah, I'll throw a thing out. But on the upside, I imagine myself, if this thing actually works, I can imagine I'll be on fucking Augusta next year. I'll have the perfect golf scene. I'll be on the 18th fairway. I'll take the fucking perfect three eye, and the crowds will be cheering at me. I'll be on the on and I'll be in the locker room drinking beers. We'll be talking about, and I'm like, all right, fine, I'll fucking do it. And I bought the thing. My man's like, oh my god, here he goes again. My man's like, you bought fucking everything. I'm a sucker, all right. And I bought this thing for seventy five dollars, right? Because I played out that movie. I said, yeah, what's the worst? I said, ah, no big deal. Whatever, right? And I bought the thing. I get there, but it breaks already. He breaks in my hand, all right? Falls the floor and fuck it. I threw it away, right? And that was that. My father, if he's walking through the airport, he hears that fuck. You know, what the hell's that? He walks over. What is that? Oh, sir, watch. It's the same thing. Watch. Does the same demonstration. My father's like, how much? That? 75 hours. What's the worst that can happen? Before my father's done, this guy would have stolen his credit card information. His Dolphson would be worse. He'd be embarrassed by his neighbors. His wife would think he's an asshole. Where would he put the fucking thing? It's gonna take up space in his golf bed. It'll probably cause him to strain his elbow. He'll end up in the doctor's office with an MRI, broke poor, living under a bridge because he bought this fucking thing. <laughs> and on the upside, yeah, maybe it'll work. Fuck it. Does he buy? That's an exactly that's what happens when people like these negative, half 
glass half empty things. They imagine if you put solar on my roof, the hurricane will come, blow the panels off, hit solar, the cap, the cap, the cap hit next door, I'll get sued by them, I'll lose power, it's going to bring down the value of my house, this guy's going to break into my house after I leave here, it's going to be the worst decision I made, the neighbors are going to hate me, the government's going to sue me, and I'll take my guns away too, before it's all over. And it'll load my bill, man, maybe, well, yeah, maybe I'll get five cents in. You know, you understand? People that have high action thresholds, they run these wacky, long, negative, disempowering movies, and they never step into the positive and imagine themselves in the future using your product, getting the benefits, and feeling good. When do we find out what someone's action threshold is? We don't find out until we say, damn, you know, I know I made a great presentation. They sound like they really are certain right now, like by their response, they're getting it, but they're just not buying. Who's going to have those people? They're like, damn, they're so close, but they just won't buy. People with low action thresholds, they buy after the first or second objection. They buy. They get, they, they're certain. What happens is technically in straight line terminology, their level of certainty, their collective level of certainty, crosses over their action threshold. It goes above their action, they feel it, they do it. That's what's happening. Their level of certainty increases enough so that it crosses over their action threshold so they say, all right, fine, I'll do it. So if someone's got an eight, eight action threshold and you get to a nine eye, they'll buy. That's why you have people say, let me think about it, let me go back, and they're like, they're like, all right, fine, I'll do it. Oh shit, how'd that happen? It wasn't magic. You said something, you did something without thinking about it that made them more certain about one of those three tens. Now, which one of the three tens were they not certain about? You don't know. It's not always easy to tell. But once you're in control of the sale, we can start running what I call patterns. These very predictable, pre-thought out patterns that touch on each of the three tens. And you start getting people to this point of absolute sort of a process of elimination. You keep hitting one, the next, the next, until you've gotten, there's nothing left. They're just so certain and they buy. Let me go over the fifth element here, and then I'll go back and spend that one more time and wrap it up. Then we'll get specific about soul. We'll take a five to ten minute break, then we'll go into soul specifically, right? Once you have the context. The fifth element is one thing left here, and it's called your pain threshold. Meaning, that when people are feeling pain, meaning they're worried, they have discomfort, they feel out of control, they tend to buy. When people are not feeling any pain, they're in denial, they, just don't, they tend to stay pat. Pain and action threshold vary inversely. As someone's pain goes up, their action threshold drops, watch. When I was about 10 years old, my parents took me on a trip from New York to Florida. We were driving about five, 10 hours out of New York City. And I'll tell you about my father. My father has this high action official guy. He just loved all his possessions and value, very fastidious. His car though, all the things my father loved his fucking car. He thought his car was a lie. He used to call it she. She's got a rattle, she's got a rattle. He loved his car, right? Ten years later, his car looked brand new, snow brings, unbelievable. And the thing about high action threshold people is they only have one guy, one salesperson for each thing they buy. They have the car guy, the shirt guy, the shoe guy. They have one person they trust, no one else. My father had a guy, he was, his name was Joe the car guy, Joe at the Sunoco station. I don't care if Enzo Ferrari himself over to fix my father's car. Uh-uh, my guy is Joe. Enzo, he ain't touching my car. Okay? My guy had Joe at the local Sunoco station. That was my Dodge car. Right? No one is fixing my father's Dodge car, okay? Except Joe at Sunoco. No one. One day we're seven hours from home. The sun is setting. Smoke starts coming out of the engine. We're in his, you know, not such a great part of Maryland, I think it was, right? Well, family's in his back in the in the back seat. My brother and I. What did my father did? Went to the first gas station he could find. And he got the car fixed. If the gas station said, 
Do we cheer and how on the thing? He to go there. He did not matter at that point. Why? Pain. His family is in danger. Ultimate pain for him. He's far from home. It's getting dark out. What do you do? Tow my car to the station. Drop us at the hotel. Fix my car. I don't care what it costs. When someone's feeling that level of pain or discomfort, what do they do? They take action. This is why when we ask people questions at the beginning, we want to identify where their pain lies, what makes them uncomfortable. And we often want to amplify that pain. Because by putting someone in a position of pain, I don't mean like it hurts, but pain, uncomfortability, they listen very closely and they're weighing your offer against the position of pain. People that are feeling pain take action now. You ever see the movie The Italian Job? It's a great movie. It's a movie about safe crackers. How do you crack a safe? The way you crack a safe is one number at a time. And you always start with which number? The first. It's, now, a safe can have three numbers in the combination, like those old master locks we had in our gym locker, right? Three numbers, and those are easier to crack. And some, the difficult ones, will have five numbers. Right? Three numbers of five, you always start at number one. You don't crack a safe by starting at number four. So what does the safe crack it do? Spins the dial, he listens very closely. Here's a click. It's got the first number. Change direction. He spins the dial back the other way. He listens closely. Click. Got the second number. Does he pull down the handle? No. Why? Because every safe's got three numbers just like every human being's got three numbers. I might have a low action threshold, but I still have to be certain about the person. I'm an idiot. Pulling down the handle on a safe is the equivalent of a salesperson asking for the order. So you get the second number, you don't pull down on the handle, you flip back to the third, click, and you pull down the handle. If it opens, you close the deal. The safe crack has cracked the safe. What happens if the safe doesn't crack? It's not open. Oh shit, it's uncrackable. No. What does he do? He spins it back to which number? The first. You always go back to the beginning. You can't crack, oh, maybe I got the second, you just took the second number. No, you gotta start at the beginning. So what does he do? He goes back to the beginning. He tries it again. He hits the first number. This is what, maybe I got one of the numbers wrong. Click, goes to the second number. Click, third number. Click, he goes, ah shit, didn't open. We say, ah fuck, now nah, I'm throwing it. Oh wait, I know. This is probably one of those safes that has more numbers. We gotta lower the action threshold. I gotta hit the fourth number. So now he listens closely again, he spins it, he hits the fourth number, puts the thing down and the safe opens and the person buys. When you are selling, when you are presenting solutions to somebody and getting them to buy, what you are doing is you the equivalent of a safe cracker to the human mind. Every person's got three numbers. Every person you're selling to has got three numbers that you must address. Number one, they must love the idea. Solar. Does the solar idea make sense? Does solar make sense? Is this the best product in class? Is it going to solve my problems? Lower my bill, give me back control of my life, power, and so forth, right? Get me tax breaks. Does the idea itself make sense? That's your first 10. The second 10 is they must trust you, the salesperson. They trust you, they connect with you, you'll be there for them for the short and long term. You're an asset to them, they trust you. That's the second one. Number three, they trust see if they better, because that's who's coming to install it. And if anything ever goes wrong, they'll be there for the long term to solve problems and do upgrades and whatever else it is. Those three elements must line up in every sale. You must get them to as close to as possible to a 10, 10, 10 on those first three tens. Sometimes you'll find out when you say, wow, they're really close, they seem to really get it, but they're still not buying. 
That means what? I have to now lower their action threshold. Easy to do, I'll show you how later. We'll lower the action threshold. And number five, I might have to add on pain and remind them of the stakes here if they don't make this decision, and that will serve to lower their action threshold as well. You must line up these five core elements. Can I ask you a question? How could you possibly do this? Look at a safe cracker. How could you possibly crack a safe if the safe was spinning the dial for you? If you weren't in control. You can't, lining up these three elements when you're not controlling the conversation is almost impossible. If the prospect is in control and you're on your heels answering their questions and they're, you're reacting to everything, their objections, their concerns, you have no shot of closing the deal. So the first step in the process is you must take immediate control of the conversation. You must take control of the sales counter. And to do that, it happens in the first four seconds and it's based on these two things. Number one, tonality and body language. It's not on the words that you say. What could you possibly say to someone in four seconds? Hey, Bill, I'm sharp as that. I'm a two seconds. I swear, I swear. I'm an expert. I swear. Back. I was like, what the fuck is wrong with this person? The words don't exist. The right words don't exist to take control of a conversation in four seconds. It happens on an unconscious level. They see you. They hear your voice. You say certain words, they can't be, I am a moron, that's not going to work very well, right? So obviously there are the best words to say here. Those are easy, we hand those to a silver platter. Hey, my name is so-so, but it's the way you say it. It's how you make eye contact. It's the certainties, how you dress, how you carry yourself, your smile, your eye contact, how you use your tonality. And like, wow, this person seems really sharp. And that opens up the possibility influence. They say, wow, this person seems really sharp on the ball. And those first few seconds, the brain, you know, your parents say, don't judge books by their covers, right? Well, guess what? They did and so do you. We all do. We judge books by their covers. We are fear-based creatures. We make instant decisions. We see someone, we size them up, we rip them apart, put them back together based on how they're perceived. And if they're perceived as being sharp, on the ball as experts, what do we do? We defer. We say, okay, they, they're experts, let me allow them to control the sale, the encounter. I defer. If they're perceived as being dull as dishwater, disinterested bores and novices, what do we do? We cut them off, we slam the door, we don't, we take control, we fuck with them, basically. They have not earned the right to ask us questions. They ask us a question, we give them a quick answer or don't answer at all. Well, we, they answer us a question, we answer them with a question. Once, what, what ticked me off that night, when I invented the straight lines, I realized my brokers kept saying, we keep getting cut off. We can't get our pitches off. Guess what, guys? That wasn't happening to me. I was getting the same objections they were getting, but at the end, after I asked for the order, I had a certain way of talking, sounding, that people would defer and they'd give me control. I lower my voice, I use certain tonalities, which are easy to learn. I'm like, damn, this guy sounds good, this girl sounds good, and they defer. Once they defer, you now have control. So what do you do? Do you talk, talk, talk? No, you use that control to start asking questions. And you start asking certain questions using certain tonalities. And as they answer, they're like, uh-huh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yup, that, and you start showing them that you care, that you understand them. You almost finish their answers sometimes, and you know what they're going to say, and they're like, wow, this guy is sharp. Damn, this girl, wow, they're good. And as you ask these questions, uh-huh, yup, mm -hmm, uh -huh, mm -hmm, yup, got it, ooh, 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 what you're saying is, I care, I feel your pain, I'm just, uh huh, yep, ah, got my eyes. Oh, um, mm, 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 mm. That's how you build rapport by asking very smart questions 
So tell me, what's your biggest worry right now? And I'm like, so what's your biggest worry right now? Well, fuck you, you know? Versus, what's your biggest worry right now? Uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, uh-huh. Unconscious communication, those little grunts and groans. By the time you're done asking all the questions that you need to ask, you know everything you need to know. You say, well, Jim, Jill, John, based on what you guys said to me, solar is a perfect big deal. Let me tell you exactly why. And then you make this beautiful, logical, mathematically, just indisputable case. And remember this before we take a break here, there's two types of certainty. There's a logical certainty, and there's emotional certainty. Logical certainty is the one, two, three, number one, two, all makes sense. It adds up. The features and benefits, everything makes sense. From a sober, logical perspective, the numbers add up. But people don't buy on logic. They buy on emotion. When they imagine themselves in the future, having made the decision, the panels are on the roof, just imagine a few years from now, your power bill is cut by 60%, you're paying off the system in full, you're selling power back to the grid, you feel good about the environment, what could be better than that? Believe me, you'll be glad you do this. Sound fair enough? Now if you haven't made the logical case, you know what happens, their brain's saying bullshit, bullshit, they didn't end, I don't understand, no, they're trying to, so you make the logical case first, and once they have logged, they're like, oh, like I said to you, I want them to say, damn, that's a good deal, I'll do it. Once I got them there, I'll close them every time. Because then I will future pace them, move them emotionally, lower their action, and step to that window and I'll close every single one. So let's take a breakdown for like 10, 15 minutes, all right? And then we'll come back and we'll get specific to solar and move on, all right? All right, cool.